I am pleased to introduce Ms. Pamela Perales Chirinus, who is our Spanish interpreter. We sincerely thank the Contra Costa County Library for providing this valuable service to our community. Presentamos con mucho placer a nuestro intérprete Pamela Perales Chirinos. Las bibliotecas del condado de Contra Costa eh, están proveyendo los servicios de interpretación al español en simultáneo para esta presentación. Para acceder a los servicios de interpretación, en unos momentos podrá usted ver el icono de un globo terráqueo en la barra de herramientas en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Al darle clic al icono de globo terráqueo, usted va a tener la opción de seleccionar español. Si no está usando una computadora, ver el icono de tres puntos suspensivos. Al igual, al darle clic, va a poder eh, seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. Ok, Albert, I'm ready to be assigned. Good afternoon. My name is Madeline Cronenberg, and on behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and Contra Costa County TV, welcome to our community conversation webinar, Universal Health Care, Part One. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This is a Zoom webinar. So the audience microphones are muted and all videos are turned off. If you have any questions for the moderator or the panelists, please submit them using the chat button at the bottom of your screen. A member of our team will share your questions with the moderator during the Q&A portion of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and at the end of the program, it will be posted to the YouTube channels of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. Site addresses for those YouTube channels will be displayed on the screen at the end of the program. Additionally, Contra Costa Television is broadcasting this webinar today and will rebroadcast the program. The dates and times will be posted on your screen at the end of the webinar. Contra Costa Television is available to watch on Comcast Channel 27, AT&T UVerse Channel 99, Astound, Channel 32, and online at ContraCostaTV.org. We will also post the contact information for our panelists and the date and subject of our next community conversation at the end of this program. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. We encourage you to join the League of Women Voters and be a part of our work. You can join the League by visiting lwvc.org slash join. This is the League's statement of position on healthcare. League position. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes it is a basic level of quality health care at, at an affordable cost should be available to all U.S. residents. Other U.S. health care policy goals should include the equitable distribution of services, efficient and economical delivery of care, advancement of medical research and technology, and a reasonable total national expenditure for health care. In 2022, the League of Women Voters of the United States made important additions to the 1993 healthcare position. These additions include equity in the level and delivery of care, financing, cost control methods that do not exacerbate disparities in health outcomes, and public participation in health policy decisions. To view the complete League healthcare position, go to page 137 of impact on issues 2022-24. Today's program is the first of a two-part series on healthcare. This session will describe the concept of universal healthcare, what it means and how it might work, as well as how a single payer system could help reduce costs and expand coverage. Part two will review potential options for single payer here in California. 
As you undoubtedly know, our current healthcare system is complex and has many competing interests. It is also a major cost driver of US spending, reaching $4.3 trillion in 2021, or 18.3% of GDP. This series is one, uh, is one approach to try to get healthcare spending under control and provide accessible, comprehensive coverage for all. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Janet Thompson. Janet is a longtime member of the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley and has served on the uh, LWV Diablo Valley Board as membership chair and program director. She retired from teaching math and science in the Akalani's Union High School District in 2007, where she was science department chair and served as district science new teacher mentor. Janet is currently chairperson of the League of Women Voters Health Interest Group and chair of Health Care for All Contra Costa County. She is a founding member and directs the Lafayette Community Garden and Outdoor Learning Center. Along with others, she is currently, uh, she created the city's environmental task force and is currently chairing the city's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee. In 2022, Janet was voted co-citizen of the year in Lafayette. Janet. Thank you, Madeline. Um, hello, my name is Janet Thomas. And um, as Madeline said, I'm a member of League of Women Voters Diablo Valley and also uh, a member of California League of Women Voters uh, Healthcare Interest Group, which is open to all League members. Uh, I'd like to thank the Contra Costa Library, uh, League of Women Voters Diablo Valley in West County and CCTV um, for hosting today's webinar. Offering equitable, affordable, high quality health care to all is a goal of League of Women Voters. <clears throat> and it's a goal that they support and which is increasingly concern of many in our communities. Today, we will hear from two very well-respected professionals about where we are in our attempts to achieve this goal and how we might get there. On April 20th, as part two of our series, we'll discuss what California is doing to achieve universal health care. Our program today will begin with a presentation from our speakers and will be followed by a question and answer period. And as you heard before, feel free to post questions during the presentation by using the Zoom uh, Q&A feature. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our two speakers. The two speakers are, um, Laurel Lucia. Hi, Laurel. Laurel is Director of Healthcare Program at UC Berkeley's Labor Center, where she's worked since 2009. Her research focuses on health coverage and cost trends in California, more specifically policies to improve access and affordability of health care for workers and their families. Her recent publications have examined impacts of rising health care costs for workers in California, policies to improve access to health insurance for California immigrants, and shifts in health coverage during COVID-19. In her current job, she provides technical assistance to policymakers and stakeholders, and has served on consulting teams to Covered California, the California Department of Healthcare Services, and Healthy California for All Commission. And in 2021, she was appointed by Governor Newsom to serve on the California Long-Term Insurance Task Force. And um, Dr. Judy um, Esterquist is with us today and um, she serves as a trustee of the Manhasset Public Library and is currently on boards of Physicians for a National Health Program, New York Metro Chapter, the Harvard Club of Long Island and Red Bull Theater. Professionally, Judy spent three decades consulting corporate executives, and as such, she worked on six different continents. Since 2017, Judy has advocated for publicly funded comprehensive health care for everyone, specifically through the New York Health Act, which would include vision, dental, hearing, and mental health care for all New Yorkers. Judy's recently worked with the League of Women Voters to update the League of Women Voters U.S. healthcare position. In 2022, this position was updated to explicitly favor single-payer funding, as well as support of other critical reforms. 
Judy now serves as the issue specialist for healthcare for League of Women Voters of New York State. I want to thank you both so much for being with us today. Laurel? Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I have the UC Berkeley campus as my Zoom background, but I am Zooming into you here from Contra Costa County. I live in Martinez. So that's where I am right now. Um, can we pull up the slides? Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start by uh, talking about our current health coverage system in California and in the US and talk about some of the key challenges, but then I will pass it off to uh, Judy to continue um, talking about some of the challenges we face. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start by talking about where Californians currently get their health insurance. We have a very complex and fragmented uh, system of health coverage in the state and in this country. Uh, in California, the biggest source of coverage is still uh, employer-based coverage through one's own employer or through a family member's employer. Um, and that is paid for jointly by employers and workers. Uh, the next biggest source of coverage is the Medi-Cal program, which is California's name for Medicaid, uh, which provides health insurance to low-income Californians. Um, more than a quarter of Californians are enrolled in that program, and it's mostly paid for uh, by federal and state dollars. Uh, and it's provided uh, primarily through managed care plans, both county-based plans and private managed care plans. Medicare is the next biggest source of coverage for Californians. Um, Medicare uh, provides health insurance to those over age, age 65 and over, and certain uh, individuals with disabilities. And it's uh, primarily paid for through uh, general tax revenues, payroll tax revenues, and uh, beneficiaries premium contributions. And it's provided in two ways. There's the traditional Medicare program in which Medicare pays providers directly. And there is also the Medicare Advantage program in which um, uh, people get Medi-Cal Medicare benefits through uh, insurance companies. Uh, the individual market is where people who aren't eligible for the, the three um, prior programs I mentioned, uh, that's where people who aren't el eligible for those generally get their coverage and they purchase it individually. Uh, and after the Affordable Care Act, uh, a majority of people who get their coverage through Covered California, the state health insurance marketplace, uh, get federal subsidies to help make premiums more affordable. So Covered California coverage is paid for typically by the federal government and households themselves. And we still have 7% of Californians who lack insurance completely. And I will talk more about that. Next slide. Uh, and so our, our healthcare system is very complex, as I said. It's been built up gradually over time. And I think uh, this picture kind of captures it well, the, the many different layers we have and um, how Probably nobody would uh, build a house that looks like this uh, if they were building it from scratch. Uh, you, you know, to, to build on the analogy, uh, this house covers a lot of people, but you know, the roof might leak. Uh, if you have guests, they might have trouble finding the front door or finding the bathroom. Uh, and, and so this, you know, has real consequences. It, it makes the system difficult to navigate. Um, and the complexity of the system also means that we spend a lot on administrative costs. And Judy will um, talk more about that. Next slide. So uh, in California, we have uh, greatly reduced the number of uninsured uh, since the Affordable Care Act, and also based on the steps that California has taken since the Affordable Care Act to continue to fill in um, the eligibility gaps. Uh, one of the most important examples is that starting in 2016, 
California has um, expanded Medi-Cal to low-income Californians, regardless of immigration status, starting with children, then young adults, then in 2022, older adults ages 50 and over. And in January, um, all age groups um, will be covered if they're low income, regardless of immigration status. But even after we take that important step next year, uh, 2.3 million uh, Californians um, we project to, will remain uninsured. Um, some of them are eligible for covered California, uh, but can't afford it even with the subsidies. Uh, there's a group of uninsured people who are eligible for employer coverage, but again, the most common reason for not taking it up is affordability concerns. Uh, some Californians are eligible for Medi-Cal, but not enrolled. Uh, common reasons include not realizing that you're eligible or are facing difficulties in the enrollment process. And then there are half a million Californians uh, who are undocumented and will uh, have income too high to qualify for the Medi-Cal expansion. And they're uh, excluded under federal law from covered California and from subsidies. Next slide. So um, not only do we have 7% of the state that's uninsured, but there are real disparities in who lacks coverage. Uh, Latinos uh, have a, a higher uninsured rate in the state than other racial and ethnic groups. And even with the Medi-Cal expansion, regardless of immigration status, um, we project that undocumented Californians will have a significantly higher uninsured rate than average of 28%. Next slide. And it's not only lacking insurance, that's a problem with our, our current system. Um, people who have insurance often have difficulty affording uh, using that insurance. Uh, and so this is uh, these are estimates from the Commonwealth Fund uh, based on a, a metric called underinsurance. Underinsurance means that you have uh, out-of-pocket expenses for co-pays or deductibles, um, or you're at risk of facing expenses uh, that are too high relative to your income. And this is especially a problem for people who uh, purchase coverage in the individual market um, directly from an insurer or in the state through Covered California, but it's a growing problem for people with job-based coverage. Um, nationally, in 2020, a quarter of people with job-based coverage were considered underinsured. Next slide. Um, a survey by the California Healthcare Foundation um, really highlights just how um, serious the healthcare affordability concerns are for Californians. Um, almost two thirds of California adults said they were very or somewhat worried about unexpected medical bills or uh, affording their out-of-pocket costs when they use healthcare services. This was last fall. And I think it's really notable that um, the, these concerns were more common than even concerns about affording rent or mortgage. And we know how big a problem um, affording rent or mortgages in California. And so some of these healthcare affordability problems ranked even higher than that. Next slide. Uh, and these affordability concerns are not just abstract, they really affect uh, the care that people get. Half of Californians uh, said that they or a family member skipped healthcare uh, due to cost concerns in the last year. This is from the same California Healthcare Foundation survey. Uh, and the rates at which uh, they skip care are even higher when you look specifically at low-income Californians or um, at Black and Latino Californians. Next slide. Okay, so I, um, I'm gonna get to this section later and I will pass it to Judy right now. Thank, thank you, Laurel. So, and thank you audience for joining us. As Janet explained, uh, first slide up, please. The League of Women Voters wants all Americans to have good health care, And for us, that means, how are we doing on slides? Yes, okay, go to the next slide. Uh, 
Um, Judy, would you like to uh, put your video on, please? please? Can you move to the next slide? Okay. Good. So what, what good healthcare for the league means is basically at least three elements. It needs to be have equitable access, meaning everyone. It needs equitable quality, meaning all essential healthcare. And it means affordable and feasible for patients, taxpayers, and physicians, all healthcare providers. The league favors single payer to achieve these goals, not today's multi-payer system. So let's discuss what multi-payer means. Next. Medicare Advantage and Medicaid and insurers like Kaiser, Anthem, and Sutter are multi-payer. It means your doctor bills some combination of you, your insurance company, your county, your state, and or CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Original Medicare is skinny single payer. Your doctors are reimbursed by CMS, not employed by it, but there are gaps in it. And the Veterans Administration and the Indian Health Services are single payer socialized medicine because unlike Medicare, the government owns hospitals and employs the healthcare workers. So why does the league favor single payer? Let's start with the costs of multiplayer and then discuss quality. Next slide, please. The cost of healthcare insurance premiums have tripled over the next past 20 years from an average cost of just under 6,000 a year to over 19,000 a year. And the worker's share has been increasing every year. That's the worker's share is the pale blue. I'm a trustee at my local public library in New York and 10 years ago, the library paid the entire cost of health insurance for its employees. Under the most recent contract, librarians now pay 20% of the premium and family coverage is 38,000 a year. Healthcare has become prohibitively expensive. Next slide. Employers are also choosing plans with greater cost sharing. The bottom blue and black lines, inflation and wages have gone up about 26%. The green line is premiums, up 54%. And the orange line is cost sharing, which has increased 162%, eight times faster than wages. This orange line, deductibles, co-pays, and everything you pay after you've paid premiums, causes huge inequities in access. It's a cost control method that was lauded in the 1980s and 90s that raises total healthcare cost, reduces access, and harms public health. So does say Canada also have skyrocketing costs? Next slide. The blue line is US costs since 1960. The yellow line is Canada's. Notice in the 50s and 60s, Canada's healthcare costs tracked ours. Then Canada enacted single payer and their healthcare rate of increase slowed. Is this a floop? fluke? Nope, next slide please. The yellow line shows the healthcare cost increase for American private insurance. The blue lines are public insurance, Medicare and Medicaid. For-profit insurance costs have increased 66% faster than publicly funded programs. But don't Canada and countries with universal healthcare pay way more taxes for healthcare? Next slide. No, again, the turquoise slides are their current healthcare costs in taxes. $4,000 to $6,000 per person, that's how much each of these countries paid in taxes for healthcare, for universal, affordable, comprehensive healthcare for their entire country. Private spending is negligible, highly regulated, and highly progressive. Now note the yellow and red lines. In 2018, Americans paid an average of $7,200 per person in taxes for healthcare, plus another 4,000 in premiums and out of packet on average. But does spending get us better healthcare? Let's look at maternal mortality. Next slide. The red line shows the US trend. That's, in, that's how many mothers die per 100,000. The black line shows a dozen peers. 
According to the World Health Associate Organization, out of 183 countries, 157 decreased their maternal mortality rates between 2000 and 2013, while the US rate rose steeply. 30 years ago, too many mothers died from pregnancy-related causes. Since then, many countries have halved their death rates. Ours have almost doubled. Next slide. Within the U.S., according to a recent study of 2 million California births uh, featured in the New York Times, the babies of poor white mothers die at twice the rate of rich white mothers. But the babies of rich black mothers die more often than those of poor white mothers. And on average, American babies die at two to three times the rate of babies in peer countries. Inequities in access, affordability, and quality are killing us. Let's take another example. Next slide. And these are gonna go rapidly. Prior to COVID, there were five leading causes of death. With COVID, they're now the top six because COVID comes in third. Next slide. But more black Americans die from these causes and die faster at triple the rate of whites for respiratory diseases and 70% higher for cancer and strokes. Next slide. And rural Americans die even faster. For cancer, it's four times the rate. For others, only triple. We'll return to this slide in a few minutes. But don't Americans overuse healthcare? Next slide. Now I'm gonna click through these slides rapidly. Just look for the yellow bar, which is the US. We see doctors four times per year. The Japanese average over a dozen visits a year. Next. We spend less time in hospitals, and we have one third of the hospital beds per thousand people that we did in 1960. Next slide. We have fewer nurses, the bedrock of good care. Next slide. We skip care more often, a lot more often. Next slide. And we skip prescriptions more than our peers, two to four times more. Most Americans, even those with insurance, can't afford health care, as Laurel was saying. A recent New York study concluded that almost half of insured residents delay or skip prescriptions and delay doctor's visits because of cost. That's similar to the California study. For-profit insurers insist that cost sharing means skin in the game, but delaying care protects profits. It's part of a business model to cut costs by delivering less care or less timely care while patients get sicker. I was astonished to learn that 90% of the $4.3 trillion we spend on healthcare goes to people with undermanaged chronic conditions, mainly using the emergency room for diabetes, heart disease, asthma. So what defines for-profit multi-payer healthcare, which by the way, distinguishes the US from every other advanced country. Next slide. In two words, complexity and profits. Many funding sources and many choices in pricing and coverage lead to paperwork and red tape, delay and denial of care, and extraordinary profits. For-profit and large nonprofit corporations prioritize their business models, attracting profitable customers who don't use healthcare and dropping customers who need it. Why do big hospitals buy up smaller ones? Why is private equity buying emergency departments? Why is private equity in healthcare at all? It's market power. If you're a hospital owns all the area hospitals, it has more power to raise prices and reduce wages. If your insurer serves the biggest employers, it can reduce reimbursement and networks. So what does funding flow look like in multi-payer system? Next slide. This is my version of Laurel's house. It's a mess, and as messy as this looks, it's actually oversimplified. Starting at the left, businesses and the government and people send money and get money from many entities. Ditto for doctors and hospitals. How much does a doctor visit cost, an ER visit, a lab test? The same service at the same place can have dozens of different prices. In 2015, the Massachusetts Attorney General sought, quote, clear cost and quality information from doctors, hospitals, and insurers, but gave up 
after three years. Getting good data proved impossible. We cannot control healthcare costs because we cannot measure them. Our multi-payer system makes them opaque. Next slide. Multi-payer insurance also exacts a huge administrative burden. When Laurel talks about administrative costs, think of this slide. The yellow area of the chart shows the increase in doctors since 1970. The turquoise shows the increase in administrative jobs, billing, payments, insurance appeals. Ask yourself why your doctor's office has so many people in the back room doing billing and insurance. Deny and delay are fundamental to private insurance business models. Armies of administrators hired by providers seek payments. Armies hired by private insurance companies deny payments. Next slide. Example, Duke Medical Center has 957 beds and 1,600 billing clerks. Next slide. The cost to send bills for one physician is almost $100,000 per year. This is not for medical care. This is just for billing. Next slide. Hospital charge masters, the list of prices, are supposed to be posted so patients can figure out what they'll owe before they're admitted. But Cleveland Clinic estimates it has 210 million prices. So many policies for so many insurers, for so many payers, for so many services. 200 million, 210 million different prices within one hospital. This complexity is unique to the US and extravagantly expensive. Next. A study in 2020 showed that every American on average pays $3,000 for the privilege of having our multiplayer for-profit system. That $3,000 per person keeps all those armies of billing clerks arguing with armies of insurance clerks. Next slide. You saw a version of this chart earlier. It shows the cost of healthcare increasing since 1960, with the cost of American healthcare rising faster after the, U after the US introduced HMOs, beginning the privatizing of our healthcare. So what do we mean about pr by privatizing healthcare? It means giving market-based rewards to private companies who do not provide care on a promise to reduce costs. In 1973, healthcare costs were 8% of GDP and politicians warned us against costs someday hitting 10% unless we acted. During the pandemic, healthcare costs as a percent of our GDP briefly reached 20%. Next slide. Now, privatization has never reduced costs, but in 1997, we got medical choice. In 2003, it was rebranded Medicare Advantage and drug plans were introduced. In 2010, the ACA created a mandate for private insurance, a further bonanza for privatization. And most recently, we have DCEs and the rebranding of ACO reach this year, privatizing Medicare by stealth. Next slide. Now we're seeing an accelerated growth of private equity from $5 billion in deals in 2000 to $120 billion in 2020. That's right, 125 times more. Private equity, meaning private ownership of shares in a company like stock, but not traded on public stock exchanges. So it has few regulations and even less transparency. Think about the Richard Gere character in Pretty Women. Private equity is now doing to healthcare what Gere planned to do to the Ralph Bellamy's company, what Julia Roberts described as chop shop, but legal. Next slide. Private equity has bought and controls an astonishing range of healthcare services. Quality has gone down, outcomes are more disparate, prices have gone up, doctors and nurses are miserable and quitting. Why is private equity in healthcare? Because it's lucrative and because both costs and profits can be hidden. Next slide. This is multi-payer, where we cannot control healthcare costs because the system makes them opaque. So what does single-payer funding flow look like? Next slide. People and businesses, starting on the left, people and businesses pay taxes. The government funds a private entity that pays providers. 
the blizzard of paperwork drops to a trickle. Funds designated for healthcare are spent on healthcare, not overhead and profit. For-profit insurance keeps 15 to 20 cents of every premium dollar, spending 80 to 85 cents on patient care. Medicare spends 98 cents on patient care, keeping less than two cents. Laurel will walk you through the financial overview, but keep in mind, even the Mercatus Foundation, a conservative think tank founded by the Koch brothers, agrees that single payer could provide more health services to more people and still spend less than we spend today. Next slide. So let's reprise the characteristics of single payer. It's funded by taxes, providers bill, and are paid by the same single payer entity. There's one plan. If you're an American, you're eligible. Your coverage is like everyone else's. Just like traditional Medicare, doctors get a standard rate and they get it promptly. The system saves money for everyone while providing more care, more equitable access, and more equitable outcomes. Remember those five leading causes of death for all Americans, urban, urban and rural, black and white, that killed too many of us too young? Next slide. Well, 86% of those deaths are preventable. 86%. These are people's lives. Americans aren't getting what people in peer countries get. And by mean by that, affordable routine care, including prevention and education. Worse, too many Americans avoid health care, even routine checkups until it's too late. We fear getting sick. It costs too much. Two thirds of bankruptcies are caused by medical debt. These differences are tragic and worse, they're needless. Next slide. Universal affordable comprehensive care, such as the Veterans Administration gives, eliminates, eliminates these stark racial disparities. For strokes and heart attacks, black veterans actually live on average a bit longer than white veterans. Next slide. Medicare also dramatically reduces racial disparities for those on dialysis and those who live long enough to benefit from Medicare. To repeat, traditional Medicare is single payer, although most Medicare recipients buy Medigap, Medigap insurance because, next slide, traditional Medicare is skinny single payer. While taxes pay for health care and doctors don't work for the government and everyone over 65 has essentially the same coverage rules, but it's got gaps and limits and cost sharing, which requires gap insurance, which means most seniors experience it as multi-payer. It's an ugly secret, but seniors can still face financial ruin from me medical bills, particularly those on Medicare Advantage who get really sick and need out-of-network specialists or hospitals. P.S. Medicare Advantage plans are twice as profitable as other health insurance. But how many of us would give up Medicare for what we had before? Not many, I'll bet. And we're now at my favorite slide. Next slide. At birth, we rank last in life expectancy among 17 peer countries. And that remains steady until we age about age 65. And at age 65, there's suddenly a 15 to 20% spike in serious diagnoses. And shortly thereafter, next slide, Americans begin living as long as our longest lived peers. Look at that. Why? You think it's the water? For the same reason that health disparities by race largely fade away in the VA and active military. Next slide. It's why the league supports improved Medicare for all. It's equitable, affordable, essential health care for everyone. Removing financial fears around routine health care so Americans can live longer, healthier lives. Relieving taxpayers and employers from unsustainable cost increases. Relieving providers from the four plus hours per day they spend on billing and allowing them to spend those hours giving care while paying them promptly and in full. Public health would improve with funding going to care, not profits. Almost 30% of the $4.3 trillion we spend on healthcare each year pays for administration and profits. Overhead would drop 15 to 20% of health dollars to 2%, and prescription costs could fall 40 to 50%. Most, most important, Americans could live longer, healthier lives. 
Powerful people should get the same great care as the marginalized. Our governors get great care whenever they need it from doctors of their choice. And so should the guys who cut their lawn and the women who serve their lunch, the same great care. Doctors who support single payer often say that programs for poor people are poor programs. And for a good program, look to Medicare. Lauren will now offer some specifics about the cost of health care in California. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk now about financing a single payer system in California. And I'm going to define this term that's on your screen, unified financing, in a minute. Uh, but what I'm going to be talking about is, is some of the work that was done by the Healthy California for All Commission. And that's a commission that was created by the California governor and legislature in 2019. And the commission met in 2020 through 2022. And this is a commission that was charged with developing a plan to make progress towards having a healthcare delivery system in California that provides coverage and access for all Californians um, through what's called a unified financing system, which could be um, including a single payer system. A single payer system is one example of a unified financing system. So a unified financing system is one in which all Californians would be brought under a single system, regardless of their employment status, their income, or any other personal characteristics. And the system would have one set of rules for provider payments, for benefits covered, for financing, and for all other features. And I, along with other UC researchers, were part of a consulting team to the commission and to the California Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, on this slide, I've included a link um, to the, the commission's website where you can find more analysis uh, and, and, and its reports. Uh, but today I'm going to give you some of the highlights of the analysis we did for the commission um, that relate to financing. Uh, and I know that uh, next month at the at the next um, version of this webinar, um, there will be more discussion about other aspects of the policy design beyond on financing. Next slide, please. So first, just to start and talk about financing in our current system, just focusing on job-based coverage, since that's uh, the biggest source of coverage. Uh, right now, the way we pay for job-based coverage is regressive. And regressive means that people with the lowest income pay a higher percentage uh, than people with higher income. Uh, and so this is looking at uh, how much is spent by uh, workers and employers on premiums and by workers on out-of-pocket costs uh, relative to a family's income. So for a family that earns $50,000, uh, the spending on their job-based coverage, both the premiums and the out-of-pocket costs, is equivalent to 40% of income. Um, whereas for a family earning more than $200,000, uh, it's only 10% of income. And the reason that we include the employer premium here in this slide is that uh, health benefits, when, when they're offered, are an important part of a worker's total compensation. If an employer wasn't um, contributing to health care, um, the worker would likely receive um, similar compensation in terms of wages or other types of benefits. And so uh, we argue that one way or another, uh, the employer uh, part of the premium really comes out of workers' pockets as well. Next slide. So our analysis looked at total health expenditures under the current system and under unified financing. And starting with the current system, uh, we estimated that in 2022, uh, the federal government, the state and local government, employers and households, and all other payers um, would spend 
$517 billion on healthcare uh, just in 2022. Um, and then when you take uh, the projected rates of healthcare spending growth, um, we used national projections here, uh, that, that statewide spending would reach $675 billion um, by 2031, and that's in current dollars. So that's above and beyond inflation. We'd see healthcare spending grow by $158 billion over the next 10 years if, if we let current trends continue. And I really want to um, highlight the green part of this um, bar chart. That's how much employers and households are spending on premium and out-of-pocket costs, not just on job-based coverage, but also in Covered California and the individual market. That portion would grow by $47 billion over the next 10 years. So that's, that's a significant amount of money that employers and households together are going to have to find if um, our current system continues as it is. Next slide. So then we looked at what would change under a unified financing system. And there are lots of different ways a unified financing system could be designed. In this example, um, we assumed that a state uh, entity would pay providers directly, uh, that there would be no cost sharing, um, and this, this scenario doesn't assume any change in um, eligibility for uh, long-term services and supports like nursing home care and home care. Um, so there are some aspects of moving to a unified financing system that would increase costs and other aspects that would result in savings. But on net, um, making this change would reduce how much we spend uh, in total health expenditures. So for example, Covering everyone would increase how we how much we spend by a little bit. Um, so would making sure that all adults have dental coverage, uh, eliminating cost sharing like co-payments and deductibles uh, would increase spending because it would remove that, that barrier to care that currently exists, including the barrier to very necessary care. Uh, if the state was able to negotiate directly with drug companies and pool all of um, California's purchasing power, um, we estimated that total health expenditures could be reduced by almost 6% just based on drug prices alone. Um, if uh, there were no more role for managed care, people would use more care because that gatekeeper role would be gone and that would result in and increased health expenditures um, on this aspect. Uh, but we'd see a lot of savings um, from uh, paying providers directly and eliminating that insurance layer. Uh, providers uh, like hospitals and doctor's offices would spend less on administrative costs and um, there would be the direct savings from uh, changing how uh, providers are paid at the system level. And then we also included some increased spending to ensure that there's a just transition for any insurance um, industry workers who lose their jobs or administrative workers in hospitals or doctor's office who lose their jobs, that they are, have financial security and a path to new employment if they are seeking it. Uh, also, we assumed that the state would need to build in um, some investment in reserves. So on net, uh, the combination of these changes means 3% lower health spending in the first year alone before you start to even consider uh, slowing the rate of cost, cost growth, which is another thing that unified financing could achieve. Next slide. So translating this into billions of dollars, uh, under a unified financing system in the first year, we estimated that total health expenditures could go from $517 billion to $501 billion. Uh, and I want to bring your attention to the green and the yellow parts of this um, exhibit, which are employer and household spending is currently about $222 billion under the current slide. Uh, but that could be reduced to 207 billion based on the savings, the net savings in this new system that we just um, discussed. Uh, and so not only would the employer and household spending potentially be lower, 
but it could also the the tax revenues could be designed um, and distributed in a way that is more fair than in our current system. Next slide. I'm not gonna go through all of these details, but as I mentioned, uh, there are lots of different ways you could de uh, design a unified financing system and the Healthy California for All Commission had a lot of deep discussion about the different design features. Um, and so we modeled a range of scenarios, some with a um, direct payment to providers from the state, others where a, a, a role for health plans or health systems is maintained. Um, we had some scenarios where there still is some form of co-payments that would be um, lower than what we currently have and more tied to income. Uh, we looked at different options in terms of whether or not long-term services and supports like nursing home and home care is expanded. And the bottom line is that in 15 out of the 16 scenarios we examined, spending would be less under a unified financing system over the long term. Uh, the one scenario where we didn't find that was essentially uh, a break-even equivalent to the current system. Next slide. Um, so the, the prior slides I showed are, are from our Healthy California for All Commission analysis, uh, but many other studies have been done um, uh, looking at single payer proposals in other states and nationally. And uh, this, this graph is showing each, uh, each uh, line at the bottom is a different single payer study from the past. And nearly all of them, all of the ones where the blue line, the, the net cost or net savings is below zero, meaning uh, the study found savings, nearly all of these studies estimated that a single payer system um, would result in net savings. So our, our analysis for the, the Healthy California for All Commission was by no means an outlier and, and consistent with a lot of past research. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, not only would we spend less, but we could we could finance the system in a in a more fair way. Um, and I just wanted to elaborate on that a little bit. So on the left is a repeat from a prior slide about how our system of job based coverage is currently financed, and people with lower income pay a higher percentage of income than those with higher income, um, and it, through a, our tax system, we could design um, a way to uh, collect those revenues in a way that's more fair. Uh, it could be a proportional system where there's a flat tax rate across um, income bands, or even more progressive would be uh, to have a system where lower income people uh, pay a lower share of income uh, into the healthcare system that compared to higher income people. Next slide. So the analysis I, I, I shared today was really focused on our, how we cover people and how we pay for it. Um, but moving to a unified financing system would not only reduce total health expenditures and potentially reduce the rate of healthcare spending growth over time, uh, it would also mean that all Californians would be covered. And really importantly, it would increase health equity. Um, you know, today I've been very focused on the numbers and the financing, um, but there is a lot of important discussion to be had about what moving to the system would mean for access, for affordability, for quality. Uh, right now we have, a, we have essentially six or seven healthcare systems and depending on which system you in, you're in and where you live, um, your access to care will be very different, your quality of care will be very different. Um, and having a single system would enable us to uh, plan better for how care is provided and would also uh, enable us to have a more equitable system. Uh, and the other point I'll close with is that, you know, as part of our analysis, I didn't want to get into the weeds on this today, but 
we looked at different ways to raise revenue and there are different um, options that are possible and each has its different pros and cons. Um, but really importantly, we could uh, finance the system in a way that is more fair than our current system. Thank you. So thank you so much, Laurel and Judy, my goodness. Um, I wanna just personally thank um, Laurel for your research, such important research that you've done and shared. Um, that has to be the base of, from which you know California and possibly the US proceeds. Um, we have to have those facts, I think, to, to make a compelling argument for the change. And Judy, um, your slides were so compelling, and I want to thank you for your activism in New York, which is now translated to the United States, and your continued work. Um, both of you um, just bring so much um, expertise to us today. So I'd like to, to now um, hand this over to Marion Showstrom. And, and before um, Marion was going to uh, turn on her video, she's going to handle Q&A. And if you do have questions and answers of our speakers, um, please put them in the Q&A. And um, Marion, uh, thanks for being here. Marion, I'm just gonna introduce as a member of League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. And she's also um, part of the healthcare, League of Women Voters Healthcare Interest Group. So again, my thanks. Thank you all. And thank you for your many, many questions. And we'll get to as many of them as we can. And um, what I'm gonna do is um, uh, start is the first question, is there a way to discuss US healthcare more broadly than only focusing on insurance coverage of costs? For example, public health policy and practices, wellness versus illness, integrative and alternative approaches, et cetera. And I think Judy answered that a little bit in the chat, but maybe everyone uh, or in the, maybe everyone would like to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, what was the question again? I didn't remember which one you're talking about. Um, uh, talking about um, Sorry. more oh, than uh, the, um, sorry. Um, to focus on um, more broadly, not just the insurance coverage, but all of the aspects of healthcare. So right now, and, and Laurel will have things to say about this. I, I would say that right now, insurance is one way to pay for healthcare. And if you think about what insurance is really for, it's a way of spreading risk. So. I can remember stories when the ACA first came out and there would be 20 to 100 people in a county and they would be spending some amount and, and, and the US, the government, the federal government insisted that if some insurance company wanted to be in counties A, B, C, D, they had to also provide uh, insurance for county X. And so they would provide insurance for this county that had only 100 or 200 people who were buying insurance. And then over the course of the year, somebody in that county got cancer. So it was a very, very expensive treatment. And then the insurance company, which insisted on discussing the risk pool by county, which by the way, that's not actually how they were making money, said, look at our risk pool. We only got a hundred times whatever the premium is. And this cancer treatment has cost 3 million we have to triple everybody's premiums. And for a couple of years, there were news stories constantly about this until it finally got straightened out. If you're gonna, if, if, if we are going to cover catastrophic healthcare issues, like a cancer diagnosis, like an accident where you break 15 bones, like there's lots of, I mean, that you shudder to think about them. The way you do it is by spreading it across many, many millions of people. So why? So one of the questions was, could New York or California actually have its own healthcare system? And the answer is California's economy is something like the fifth, fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. It's got a larger economy than most of the countries we've heard of. 
And New York is like the 10th or 11th largest economy in the world. There are lots of countries that have universal health care and they can pay it because they spread it across everybody in the country. Thank you. And um, here's, here's a question about the fact that someone on Medi-Cal insurance, the closest provider to who will accept Medi-Cal insurance is more than an hour away. And th this person is disabled and unable to get to the closest provider an hour away. So does healthcare policy uh, change Change that. The focus there, there, on there, 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 but also on the amount of physician access to healthcare that actually accept the insurance. And Laurel, you um, take that one. Hmm? I'm saying Laurel, Laurel should take that one because I would answer Sorry. from the perspective of New York, but I bet it's the same. Well, one thing I want to say in response to this question and some of the other uh, questions I see in the chat is at least my focus today was one slice of what makes up healthcare. Uh, like how we finance it and who's eligible uh, and, and how much people pay. There, there is so much more to healthcare as, as people have been saying in the chat. Um, and, and this is one good example. Um, just because everyone is covered doesn't mean that everyone has access. Um, and I think um, the person asking the question gave a, a really common and good example uh, that access is very uneven depending on where you live in the state and also depending on what type of insurance you have. And uh, the healthcare workforce uh, is, is one really important factor in uh, improving access and uh, making access more equitable. Uh, and you know to have a, a stable and adequate workforce, um, we need to look at a lot of different factors like training programs, uh, but also the quality of the jobs and uh, do these jobs pay enough um, for people to do the work. Um, and so I appreciate um, people in the chat bringing in other aspects of the healthcare system beyond I was focused on the ones I do, aspects I do research on, but there is so much more to healthcare than uh, financing and who's covered. And you know, beyond access, there's quality, um, public health policy, um, like someone mentioned. Um, health insurance is just one um, aspect of health. But I think the question is whether, under the current system, people are paid different physicians are paid different amounts and under a single payer system would would it be more likely that someone on medical would find a position who would accept their so, so i'm going to take a gander because i've looked at earlier california laws so i don't know as much about this one but the new york health act which is in some which isn't funded the same way New York and California have very similar laws, uh, programs, although they are funded differently. And that is also true for Medicare for All, both the Sanders bill and the Jayapal bill. But the issue around, around uh, the program is if you have a single payer system, then any physician that wants to practice at all in the system has to accept patients and has to accept what the reimbursement is. So right now, if you live an hour from anybody else in the world, I mean, I assume there's places, maybe not in California, but just to the east of you, where you can live an hour from anybody, then you might have to travel to see a doctor unless you have good telehealth and you can do it by telehealth. But if you live in a relatively populated area of California, there will be healthcare providers closer to you and all of them need to be in the system and they're going to get the same amount for treating you, assuming that they do the same things to you, as any other doctor. That's what happened with Medicare. You were either in Medicare or you weren't. And amazingly, about 96% of the doctors in the U.S. take Medicare. Not all of them take Medicaid, which has a much lower reimbursement rate. But here, they would get all the same reimbursement for the same service. So... So an, um, another question is, um, 
wouldn't higher income payers have to pay more taxes? And why isn't it on the ballot for us to vote? I don't think our doctors would go for this. Wouldn't it lower doctor wages? I, I can address at least the first part about, about taxes and, uh, you know, the devil is in the details in terms of how, which taxes we'd be using and, and how, what, how the tax rates would be set. But overall, uh, California households can pay less. And, and that would have to be a decision that policymakers and voters would have to make in terms of how the distributive effects would work. Um, you know, there might be a decision that in order for lower income people to um, pay less, um, there could be some higher income people that have to pay more. Um, but that, yeah. Uh, this, I would like be surprised if California were as a regressive a system as it is now. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be more progressive than now. So the answer is that, so in New York, the way they initially set it up, and they're now redoing funding slightly, but they went into great detail on this. And physicians would be paid the average of what physicians get from private insurance now, because it is a myth that physicians who get private insurance all get great reimbursement. If the private insurance has a monopoly in this geography, they control how much doctors get, which is why hospitals and doctor organizations keep getting larger and larger so they can argue with larger and larger insurance companies. So in New York, doctors would not get less. They'd actually get, many of them would get more. Specialists may get less, but we have many more specialists in this country than we, than we really need. What we need more of are primary care, pediatricians, OBGYN, first level therapists, and people who do what I call frontline medicine, people who actually talk to patients rather than running some tests and running some surgeries and doing some, some pills. People who actually diagnose and deal with people, they would get more. What was the other half of this question? Yes. People with higher incomes probably would have to pay more, although one of the California bills had a sales tax, was raising money through sales taxes, which basically is hits. And I think then they gave a tax credit for people who made less than 40,000. It's really complicated to try to do it off sales taxes, which are regressive. You devil in the details. Agree with Laurel. And on the physician question, I would just add that the analysis I showed assumed that in the first year of a unified financing system, on average, in aggregate, doctors would be paid the same, hospitals would be paid the same uh, as they are under the current system. Uh, but that under a unified financing system, we have better tools to slow the, the spending growth each year. And so uh, payments might not grow at the same rate they currently are, but they would at least start at the same rate as under the current system. And, and one and other I thing which came out is that doctors currently spend apparently an average of four hours a day and young doctors spend more because they haven't got the diagnostic, diagnostic codes memorized on basically billing issues, either coding. So how many of you have had been the experience that when you go see your doctor, they sit at a computer and they spend a lot of time typing and not a lot of time with eye contact. That's because they are entering billing information effectively is what it is. So and if you cut that out, they'd have that time to actually spend with patients. So there's an expectation that doctors might, only, might not only be able to spend more time with the patients that they wanted to spend more time with, but they would be able to see more patients. And I would also like to say that April 20th, part two, we'll talk more about California. And there is a healthcare cost calculator that you will be shown and you can put in what you pay now and what you would pay under a single payer system. So you may wanna come back for that. And um, Someone asks the question, are any other states using a single payer system at the moment? No. 
But yeah. lots and lots of countries have universal care of which single payer is something between what it is and between what, what that country is and a very large percentage of what that country does for their health care. And when those that have private insurance, it's highly regulated insurance over what it covers and how much it can cost. And there is often an income adjustment for whoever is paying for it. Um, so someone also asks about um, our, how, given the fact that we are a litigious society, um, do you have any information on the insurance that physicians and hospitals have to cover for medical liability? Do you, I, do you want to answer this one, Judy? Go ahead if you want to do it. No, I, I, don't, I don't have information. So, so the answer is that medical malpractice may, the rates for that may drop 90%. I'm not going to promise that, but they're going to drop precipitously. And the reason they are is that in this country, part of the reason that medical malpractice trials result in such huge settlements and or and our uh, uh, awards is that if a child, for example, is injured, that child's medical care for the rest of their life is going to have to be paid for. Whereas if you have a single payer system where the health care is guaranteed, that that cost, that child will get health care without having a cost associated to it. So the only thing that medical malpractice will will typically have a large payout for is actual criminal liability or or uh, reckless reckless behavior. Um, and what you want, I mean, in in Canada, medical malpractice is 10, 20 percent of what it is in this country, even for things like obstetricians. And um, thank you, Judy. And here's another question. Um, it's about long-term care, and it looks like universal health care will cover long-term care. Um, would you discuss how this affects those who are now paying for long-term care plans? And um, perhaps since Laurel is on the California Commission to study long-term care plans, mm -hmm. maybe you could answer that? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about two different commissions here. The in, in the Healthy California for All Commission, we did, you know, look at options that would include expanding uh, long-term care as part of a single payer system. Uh, but we didn't get into like a lot of the fine grain details about what that would mean for um, people who already have private long-term care insurance. Um, but this definitely is something that's been discussed in the California Long-Term Care Insurance Task Force, uh, which is looking at uh, different options for a state program uh, that would essentially cover people who aren't eligible. Uh, it would include people who are eligible for Medi-Cal, but the main intent is to fill in the gap between uh, people who are eligible for Medi-Cal and can get long-term care services through that program and the the very small percentage of the California population that has private long-term care insurance. There's a huge middle that, that has no type of coverage for long-term care. Uh, and uh, in that task force, uh, uh, what they're looking at is, is that uh, people who have long-term care insurance when the program starts might be able to opt out when, when the new program starts. But on an ongoing basis, anyone new who enrolled in long-term care insurance uh, would have reduced contributions for the state program. Uh, and uh, a person with private long-term care insurance would draw on that insurance first, but then the uh, assuming they hadn't opted out of the program completely, uh, they would be able to also use the state program if they exhaust their benefits under the private program. But there are a lot of different ways that could be designed. Yeah, there's a lot. So, so in the, I'm not sure that the federal bills address that very well in New York because there was a lot of concern about how do you pick up. The, the promise in New York with the bill was that you would 
not have to pay premiums for anything, and even Medicare Port B premiums and A premiums, the state would reimburse your Social Security. It's typically taken out of Social Security. Um, so with long-term, the long-term care, they the state would keep your long-term insurance and pay your premiums for you so that you have your long-term insurance and you don't have to pay for it anymore. Because that way the the private insurance that's giving it still has to manage your risk. So there's um, some questions about um, public uh, attitudes and um, toward um, universal health care and how how can um, we change attitudes? Do you have any ideas? Programs uh, like this? Education, education, education. So um, another question, uh, another question is about corporations and their effect on government. And uh, this uh, person says that corporations currently pay for a large part of health insurance. So what, would they support single payer health care because it would save them money? I think it's a really good question. And, and I personally haven't seen as much interest from employers and single payers you might expect. I think it would be very rational for employers to be interested in single payer um, because uh, it's a, a problem for them, like it's a problem for workers that, that healthcare costs are growing more rapidly than other economic indicators like wages. And so every year they have to figure out how they're going to cover that additional cost. Are they going to pass it on to workers? Are they going to take it out of profits? Like, what are they going to do? Um, so uh, I, I do hope that employers start to pay more attention to the idea of single payer, but I guess I would say I haven't seen a ton of interest yet. <laughs> so, so I would opine that for the largest employers, they basically self-fund which means they don't give money to an insurance company for premiums. They don't have an insurance company do it. What they do is self-fund with, with agreements with doctors. But what you're also seeing is that has now become so expensive that a number of companies now are attempting to have, you know, Options like Google has, has a net, is, I think is using Amazon's network uh, of telehealth almost exclusively. So, so you see a nurse practitioner as a always as the gatekeeper. Um, and this was supposed to be a technical a technology issue, and everybody's going to love it. And Silicon Valley is filled with technologists, and aren't we going to adore it? And I am hearing from some folks who are close to me who work at Google that they hate it, they hate it, they hate it. So, you know, the companies are trying to figure out how to save money and there isn't an easy way of doing this. So um, this question I think is for Laurel. Um, could you speak a little about why labor unions don't seem to be supportive of a single payer system? There is support for single payer among labor unions, not all unions support it, but um, I've seen some folks participating in this call who are part of the Healthy California Now Coalition, which um, a number of California unions are part of, um, which is supporting single payer. Um, I think, I think, uh, and I think those unions see what a, a problem uh, our current system is in terms of bargaining because uh, so much attention and focus is on how do we address rising healthcare costs at the bargaining table and that um, that in, impedes unions ability to negotiate for higher wages and healthcare is often a focus of strikes. Um, and so uh, I think that's why a lot of unions do support single payer. Uh, but there are unions who 
are either hesitant or uh, not supportive of single payer. And I think um, there, a lot of it comes down to a concern about change. Like unions have fought for many years for to, to um, negotiate good, good health benefits. Uh, and, it, you know, change does involve some risk. And uh, I think that that is the, the main driver to the hesitancy among some unions. What Laurel just said, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's another question about, there are a couple of questions about increased taxes to pay for a single payer system. Would it be similar to social security tax and Medicare tax? For a single payer system? Yes. Uh, it could be through a payroll tax or a common uh, income tax, a pro, you know, ideally a progressively financed income tax. Um, as, as Judy mentioned, sales tax is one of the financing sources that has been brought up in different settings, um, but that does tend to fall hardest on the lowest income people. Um, uh, California has also talked about a gross receipts tax, which is a, a tax on uh, it's like a business related tax, but ultimately you have to look at um, who is affected by the tax, even if it's a tax on businesses, is that going to affect the prices that consumers pay? Um, so there's, a, there are a lot of different options. Uh, and if you go to the um, Healthy California for All Commission website and the final report of the commission to the legislature, there's a table that that kind of lists out some of the different options that were analyzed and, and how much revenue uh, could be raised. So I would like to point out here because people whine about taxes because nobody likes taxes. I mean, who's gonna raise their hand for taxes? Although my father used to say, taxes are what you pay for a good government. Okay, but he's long dead. Um, but what I would say is think about all the studies that Laurel put up that say single payer will cost us less than what the current is. And costing us less means that nobody will have go bankrupt because of medical debt. Right now, something like 30 to 50% of New Yorkers have medical debt. That, that will go away. So while I personally might pay more next year, Maybe I wouldn't. It depends a little bit on how, you know, everybody would be safer. And here's, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, aren't the insurance providers the only ones who lobby against a change from the current system to single payer health care? Are there other organizations that are lobbying for big pharma? very large hospital corporations outside of California and New York. Well, and I think even in California, we will de definitely see concern from hospitals and, and uh, medical groups about what single payer would mean for, for them. Thank you so much. Okay, yes, thank you, Marion, for doing a great job. And um, Laurel and Judy, there are lots, lots I'm sure, of, of, of questions people still have. I um, want to remind everyone that we will be having another um, uh, community conversation this next month. And I imagine, um, you know, uh, that um, Laurel and Judy, you know, um, will continue their great work. And we've got a resource list at the end of the um, of the program. People can um, can get answers uh, to their questions in many other ways. Um, Laurel and Judy, thank you so much for your work, your commitment, and wonderful program today. Thank you. So um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, League of Women Voters of Contra Costa County, uh, Contra Costa Library, and CCTV, I want to again extend a genuine thank you to each of our panelists for being here today. Laurel and Judy, you were great. Um, this was a very timely conversation, very compelling. Um, I'd like to, um, next slide. 
<clears throat> thank um, Laurel again, Laurel Lucia, and you can see there is her email address. Laurel, would you be willing to accept emails from our part, our audience members? Yes, I'd be happy. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And uh, Judy Esterquist, um, I'm going to ask you the same question, Judy. Yes, and what I'd like is if you could put the if you could put the name of this, if you could say Contra Costa Library or something in the subject line, so I know. Okay, okay, yes, thank you so much. I also want to thank the audience for coming today. We had over a hundred attendees, and I know that some people will be viewing this later. Um, this community conversation. Uh, Universal Healthcare Part 1 is going to be rebroadcast on CT CTV on the following days and times. Next, next uh, slide. And this community conversation is also available on YouTube channels of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and Contra Costa County Library. So if you would like to view this again, or if you would like to um, tell someone about it, you can um, find a YouTube link, either of these places. So please save the date for our next community conversation, which is April 20th at the same time. And it's gonna be Understanding Universal Healthcare Part Two. It's gonna be a continuation of today's conversation and the emphasis will be on work and changes being made in California. Community conversation programs, as um, was mentioned, they're a partnership between the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa, and the Contra Costa County Library and CCTV. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. The League never endorses or opposes candidates or political parties. We influence public policy through education and advocacy, and we invite everyone to join us. Please consider that. Thank you so much for being with us today.